Hey. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so I want to tell you a story. It was my 10-year wedding anniversary in 2020. Remember that year? LOL. Um, and I remember, so Randy and I were celebrating 10 years of marriage, of course, not knowing that two months later he would be in heaven. <clears throat> and there we were, and plans had been disrupted. We were supposed to be in Hawaii. You want to know where we were? Getting takeout instead. We got takeout, and we sat across, which is good, because, I mean, we literally sat there, and we had this moment where we're like, I guess the whole point is like each other, not like a destination spot. The gift, what we want to celebrate is each other. And he's like, well, what's God doing in you? And I said, oh, you know what keeps sticking with me was this um, GLS speaker who originally gave a TED Talk that got wildly famous. Basically, this guy um, <laughs> struggled with feeling rejected all the time. And so he had this moment of rejection as an elementary school student, and then he found himself in his 20s super disappointed in himself, and he's like, I've literally lived out of a narrative from when I was like eight my whole life. And he goes, i got to get rejection proof or something. So he does something really smart. He goes to Google, and he looks up how to become rejection proof, and he comes across rejectiontherapy.com. So he signs up. And what that was was to take a, I forget how many days, journey <laughs> to set yourself up for failure for like 100 days straight so you can learn more about yourself and your response to failure so eventually over time you're not worried about it anymore. It was things like this, day one. Ask to borrow $100 from a stranger. Day two, request a burger refill. Day whatever, take a nap at the mattress store. <laughs> I mean, he literally, and he, and he tells the story. It's really funny and humorous, but basically over time, he's like, it's okay to fail. It's actually okay. And I looked at my husband that day, and I was telling him, we were laughing about the stories. I pull up a video, we watch it. And I said, you know what I want to do? I want to do something risky like that. He's like, uh-oh. And I was like, no, I'm going to do a risk experiment starting today. I'm going to risk every day when that Holy Spirit prompts you to do something kind of crazy, I'm going to say yes for the next 100 days. He's like, you sure? I'm like, yes. And here's why. Because this thing is real. And to be honest with you, I was kind of expecting these epic failures. And I remember like day one, my son's like, I had stuff to do. My son's like, do you want to go on a scooter ride? And I'm like, there's that little like, you should go on a scooter ride. I'm like, I don't have time for a scooter ride. <laughs> But I went on a scooter ride and then ended up running into a neighbor whose sister's out of town visiting who basically found out that, she, and I just could discern that she just needed prayer, but not the type of prayer where you're like, I'll totally pray for you and then you leave and forget, but the type of prayer where you pause, stop, and actually do it in the moment. And then it was one of those moments where I'm looking at her and tears are flying down her face. I'm like, well, this is the best, you know? Next day, it was just like paying attention to a coffee shop worker and asking her how her day really was and really getting her eyes attention. And it was little things. I also kind of expected it would be bigger things. It was just like small kindness, small acts of generosity, which I was really grateful it wasn't like pay for that guy's mortgage, but it was thrilling. I got to day 73, and to be honest with you, that was the day that Randy went to heaven, and I was bummed that my risk journey had stopped, but in hindsight, in preparing this message, I realized I didn't stop my risk journey. I didn't even realize this in my first message. I realized it in this one. I didn't stop my risk journey. <laughs> I'm still putting it all out there because I really still believe this thing is true and real. Do you? I'm literally <laughs> banking every part of my life on it. How about you, church? That's what this message is about, by the way. Some people are like, I don't want to pay for their mortgage. It's okay. <laughs> Run What Gives, part three. And we're going to study the first century church in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four. We'll start in chapter two. And how they lived. And here's what we're going to find. They just were part of a different kingdom than the kingdom of this world. And by the way, it's the same kingdom we're invited to participate in. Not just be a part of, but literally participate in. And I hope you're excited. Are you? 
Acts chapter two, here's what it looked like for them. They, verse 42 of chapter two of Acts, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So they were devoted to coming to church for teaching. They were devoted to showing up and having people over to their house. Even when it's hard, even when you feel left out and you're not invited. You know what Jesus' advice would be to you, by the way? If you feel left out and uninvited, what do you wish someone would do for you? Jesus' advice, turns out the golden rule was Jesus' quote. Did you know that? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. If you feel uninvited, can I tell you Jesus' advice? Go first and invite them this week. So they were devoted to that sort of stuff. To the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They got to see miracles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. In other words, nothing was theirs. But what was theirs, verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Before I move on, how crazy. You know what also is kind of crazy is this building. And isn't it cool to imagine the people have gone before us so that we could just enjoy it? Jeez, people really have believed in this thing. How about you? Okay, hold on. Whatever. Okay, here we go. No, yeah, it deserves that. I'm sorry. I'm sassy today. Are you guys ready? doesn't matter. Uh, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I'm really excited about this one. Here we go. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Here's what they were doing. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. How in the world did people live like this when it comes to their finances? How in the world? And I'll tell you how. They had a kingdom heart. Would you pray with me that God would either begin or continue that work in us so our lives might look radically different? Let's pray. So Father, as I think about money, I just wonder what comes up in everybody. Is there fear, worry, annoyance, disappointment, pressure? I pray right now that we'd open it up to you so that this message could meet us there. Holy Spirit, hear our prayers, the ones we don't even know how to pray. What's the truth? Help us to be honest. And God, I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray and all God's children said, amen. So if they had a kingdom heart, here's where we're headed. What is the kingdom of God? Two, Who's a part of the kingdom of God? Three, what is the kingdom of God like? And then we'll wrap it up of when is the kingdom of God? So first, what is the kingdom of God? Here's put simply, the kingdom of God is anywhere that God is king. <laughs> the kingdom of God is anywhere that God is king. And the kingdom and its language, and this, by the way, kingdom language is everywhere. It's literally when a kid holds a toy and says, mind, ownership, authority, <laughs> ruling and reigning, and it's everywhere. In fact, any guesses on to where in the Bible was the first mention of kingdom living or ruling or reigning? Any ideas or guesses? This would be where you'd try. <laughs> Some, Genesis, you're right. And guess what? Page one. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. So God creates everything. He clearly is the king, the ruler, the creator. He's everything. And when he gets to the pinnacle of creation, day six, he creates us. Now listen to the language. He starts teaching about kingdom and authority when he creates us, when he says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may, what's the next word? Rule. Did you catch that? First time he makes mention of it has to do with us ruling. But his language here is in the context of him as clear creator, clear king, but what he chooses to do is entrust us to rule. Another word would be steward what he's entrusted us with. So let us rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. He has literally entrusted us 
to steward as a part of his kingdom from creation. So what happened? What went wrong? Well, we began to believe very quickly. In fact, just two chapters later, we have it recorded. Because while the truth is that what you think you own is really just on loan, Adam and Eve lived as if, not as if they were stewards, but as if they were the kingdom rulers. And Satan hijacked this world for his own kingdom and then convinced us to focus on ours instead. And he's been doing it ever since. The humanity falls, which by the way is why Paul refers to Satan in 2 Corinthians in the New Testament as the God of this age, which is why it's so significant that when Jesus comes on the scene, and if, by the way, if you were to lean in and wonder, if you were gonna, gonna hear, if you're in the first century and you heard that this Jesus is giving sermons and he's talking and he's speaking, then you were to lean in. Any, any guesses on what you think he might be talking about? Because if you go based on just the number, the number one topic he talked about, the kingdom is near. And by the way, the entire Old Testament, everyone had been waiting for the promise that was given in Genesis chapter three. So after the fall, after we literally become convinced that our job is to build our own kingdoms, after that moment, Jesus promises that one will come, that will crush the head of the serpent. And there's a promise, and so everybody is waiting. And when Jesus comes, he says, repent. The kingdom of God is near. And everyone, I can only imagine people actually shaking because they had heard a whole lot of the kingdom. I'm not going to go into the entire Old Testament. I did that by myself, and it was rich and dense. But they knew what the kingdom was. And so when he says the kingdom of God, they thought, okay, there he is ruling and reigning from above. And he goes, no, 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 it's here, and it's breaking forth. And he, by the way, didn't just declare it. He showed it. Because you want to know what the kingdom is like? People are healed from mental illness, freed up from it. Hungry people are well fed. See, he's bringing in the kingdom and he's uncovering it here. And he's doing it in such miraculous ways. And he also says, but he also teaches that when the king shows up, anyone that's a citizen of that kingdom has to therefore come under that rule and that reign. That's why he begins a sentence like this, repent. What is repent? Repent means turn from. What are you turning from? The kingdom of this world that says it's all about your kingdom. So repent. Why? Because the kingdom is near. And it's referencing God's rule and his reign is not far off. It's actually at hand. And when the king comes, a response is expected. And the king, Jesus himself, doesn't just say that it's here. He doesn't just act like it's here. We see it, yes, through his life, but we also see it through his death. The kingdom of God. Because that's anywhere God is king. And I know that I know that I know that a lot of us believe that the kingdom of God is heaven, and it is. But it's also here. It's Jesus. In fact, his death, why is that part of the kingdom? Here's why. Because he believes in eternity with God forever and ever and ever, and amen, and he believes and he knows that the one thing that would keep us from that is gonna be our own sin. So that's why he goes to the cross and we see the power of the kingdom in him taking our sin upon himself so that nothing could ever keep us from the kingdom. We see it not just in his death, we also see it in his resurrection. Because in his resurrection, death suddenly becomes undone for all who believe. This is why after his resurrection, he shows the proof that he's alive for about 40 days and he gathers the people on the mountain. Do you remember it? Matthew 28 and gives that great suggestion, <clears throat> commission, and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why does he say all authority? Because what is he leaving out that is within his authority? Nothing. All authority. He is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. And friends, he is alive. And here's what happens. He gathers them, he equips them, and he ascends into the heavens where he is seated presently at the right hand of God. I believe it with all my heart and I'm living like it's true. And so, here's the truth though. I can believe that and I'm still living here in the mess and the chaos and the grief and the pain and the hope and the depression and the despair. Anyone else? So what do you do about that? Because I not only know that he ascended, I also know that he's coming back. And here we are just waiting. He gives word to that too. When the father says, 
Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You want to know how long he's waiting there until the father makes the enemies a footstool for his feet. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. You want to know why I'm encouraged by that psalm? Because it is the most quoted passage of Scripture in the entire New Testament. It's like God wants to give us hope. This world and all its pain is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. One day, he'll be crushed. And in the meantime, we get to know this really powerful truth about God. He is still king, and he is still ruling, and he is reigning. He is on the throne, and his reign will be established forever. And yet, we are still here aware that his enemies have yet been made his footstool, or another way of putting that is brought into full submission. Sin is defeated, but it still ravages our stories. Satan has been conquered, but he still oppresses Death has been undone, but it still stings. Here's what I want to tell you. Psalm 145, 13 says this about God's kingdom. David writes, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Is that good news for anyone? And your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. Friends, Satan is on a leash. We make choices, but you need to know that not for a moment God has abdicated his throne. Not for a moment. And let me give you a really weird personal picture of what this means for me this week. This week is a heavy grief week for me. I sat with a dear friend And she works for crew. Actually, she volunteers for it. And she said, there's a table, and there's all these pictures at the crew gathering, Campus Crusade for Christ, and all the students were supposed to pick up two pictures. Number one, the first picture was going to be to describe their life right now. The second picture they needed to pick up would be what they want their life to be. They had to pick up two pictures just to have discussion. My friend's looking and carrying all the weight, and maybe I wonder what you're carrying, by the way, as I'm saying this. I think there's a lot of us that are carrying the weight of, like, other people's pain, right? Or maybe it's your own. And this is my friend's story. So she grabs a picture that's a picture of this like really struggling baby bird and there's a, and it's in some hands. And she goes, that's what I feel like my life is. I have my little hands and I'm holding, whether it's your personal pain or the pain of other people or whatever it is. She's like, this is what my life is. And then she goes, and I have to pick up a second picture to describe what I want my life to be. She holds that picture. She looks She's like, I got nothing. None of these pictures look like what I want my life to be. And then she glances back at this picture and God flips it. She goes, it's the same picture. I'm just the baby bird. And God's holding me. The king of the world has you. He's holding you as you hold them. He's holding you as you're holding your pain. He's holding you as you're holding your money. He's holding you as you're holding every single thing he's asked you to steward for his kingdom. And whatever you're holding is precisely what he's calling you to steward. Some of it's your story. That's what I'm holding right now. And he's literally calling you to steward it for his glory. But I got to tell you, let me flip the hands He's got you, and it's okay that you're the baby bird. In fact, that's why his kingdom is so upside down. Remember the Beatitudes when he describes the kingdom? Jesus says this, blessed are the baby birds, the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom. kingdom. Blessed are those who cry. That's what the kingdom is like. Because there's really a king, he's really coming back. There's a real enemy We can weep at the fact that this world is not as it should be, and that's actually living in part of the kingdom. That's the blessed life because you're basically aligning your heart with his and saying, would your kingdom come? And it will make you desperate enough to pray again. Okay, where am I? What is the kingdom of God? It's anywhere God is king. And I want to tell you this, who is part of the kingdom of God? Can I tell you where he wants to be king? First and foremost, he wants to be king of your heart, king of your life. And that's why this message is within a giving series as we're talking about what gives a kingdom heart. What gives is when the king is in your heart because he modeled that he first gave it all. And so we just simply look more like him. Who's in the kingdom of God? It's everyone who has declared with their mouth, Jesus is the Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. 
This is the good news of the gospel. And Paul, the apostle Paul gets real vivid when he says this in Colossians chapter one, verse 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Rescued, present tense. Not one day he will come back and just rescue and pull you out of it. I'm telling you this. He actually has rescued you right in the midst of it as he holds you. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. This is made possible by the blood of the lamb, the sacrifice that took all sin for all time, placed it on him, and the power of his resurrection that puts his life in us. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, from being ruled by it. Doesn't mean we won't be tempted by it. We're just ruled by it. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and all the other kingdoms and brought us into the kingdom, a new one of the son he loves. That's what he's rescued us to. And all who believe Jesus is king are citizens of this kingdom. And Jesus was so strategic to not leave us alone to battle as we endure. As I was praying, sorry. As I was praying backstage, here's what came to mind. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, right before he gets into the, f- the full armor of God, he writes this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I know right now you think that the enemy is that spouse or that circumstance that you're in or that really difficult coworker, and I wanna tell you that's not the enemy. The enemy is the one that's making their life rough, the one who's telling them to live into a different kingdom, and when we do, things start to crumble. It's started all the way on page three. Our battle is against the enemy, and I also have to simultaneously tell you that your God, your king, has equipped you for the battle. Why? Because you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're gonna keep moving because I'm running out of time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four guys that give an eyewitness account to the life of Jesus. This is the first five books of the the New Testament. It's important to know. Here's why. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John give an eyewitness account to the life of Jesus. The next chapter in the story. So in other words, if you're reading it like chronologically, you could read Matthew, then Acts, or Mark, then Acts, or Luke, then Acts. Luke actually wrote Acts, so that'd be a fun one. And then you got John, then Acts. The next chapter of the story is Acts. That is the beginning of the church era, which by the way, we're still in. Here was something that was always a little bit confusing to me about the order of the gospels. All four gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them have a great commission. This great go, you're a part of the plan moment at the end where Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, gathers the people and tells them the plan that basically it's them, don't screw it up. For real, don't. (laughs) But you can't, because he's king. And so in Matthew's gospel, he says this, all authority, remember? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, the king. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you. I'm working hard. You've got to join me. <laughs> all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Get out of here and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything I have taught you. This message you sit in every single week is never just for you. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am With you when? Here's where I got confused. The end of Matthew, he says that. I am with you always. He promises his presence. The next chapter of the story is Acts chapter one, where Jesus ascends into heaven to sit at the right hand of God, which is where he is presently at. Why is that confusing? Because Matthew 28, I'm with you always. Chapter one, see ya, he gone. (laughs) Is that confusing? What? We're just left to endure? Oh, friends. The reason he ascends into heaven is because he always keeps his promises. Jesus, fully God, fully man with skin on, could only walk with a few, yet he planned for his presence to also make it to Chicago. He promises his presence for all who believe. See, the story goes like this. Acts chapter one, he ascends. Acts Acts chapter two, he descends by the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell within those who believe. By the way, my favorite verse right now is Acts 1.1, which says this. Luke writes, see if you're tracking, ready? In my former book, the book of, no, guys, this is from Acts. Try again. Luke writes, in my former book, the book of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began. Thus assuming that the book of Acts is what? If that one's what he began, this one's what? What he's continuing, right? Good. Jesus says that. 
Luke is writing this about Jesus. That that first book is what Jesus, he didn't actually say it, this is what Luke wrote about him. That book was about what Jesus began. This book, the church era, is about, therefore, what Jesus is continuing to do. But friends, Jesus ascends into heaven in chapter one. Why? Because he descends by the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell within all who believe, who surrender their lives to the lordship, kingship of Jesus, which means this. Do you wanna know what Jesus is up to and why it matters for you to participate in the life of the kingdom? Because what you're doing is precisely what Jesus is doing in this world by the power of his spirit in you. That former book, that's what Jesus began. This book, church era, is what Jesus is continuing to do, except this time the way he's doing it is through the spirit in you. The context you cannot miss in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four, which we're about to read, is this. The people that lived as a part of the kingdom were full of the Holy Spirit. That's what changed. They gave their life over to King Jesus and King Jesus became ruler of their heart. And when he rules your heart, it changes how you do your finances. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And you got someone who rules your heart. If you're wondering what it practically, tangibly looks like, let me say this, watch a video, and then I'll wrap it up. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. This is two chapters after they sold everything, and here's what they did a couple chapters later. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. Look at that. No one claimed that their stuff was theirs. It's like they almost went back to how they were created. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, they rejected ownership and remembered stewardship. None of them claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They just shared everything they had because it wasn't theirs anyways. Anything you think you own is really just on loan. They rejected ownership, remembered stewardship. Verse 33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Why did they do all this? To proclaim the resurrection. Resurrection proclamation. Why did they do what they did? They explained it. Because the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in them, and they couldn't shut up about it. In fact, the the reason the church grew in Acts chapter 2 is because that's precisely what Peter talked about. You'll see these massive movements in the church era, specifically through the books of Acts, when people talk about Jesus rose from the dead. They proclaimed the resurrection. And lastly, verse 34 They did this, the grace was so powerfully at work in them, verse 34, that there were no needy persons among them. For from the time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. Oh, they're doing it again. And look where they bring it. Brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. You see, when they rejected ownership, remembered stewardship, proclaimed the resurrection, the manifestation of it was a radical generosity as they brought it to the apostles to distribute. If you're wondering what that looks like, check this out. Gather around, kids. Gather around. Scooch in. It's one of my favorite stories, and it took place in the city called Chelm a long, long time ago. And it's called the Disappearing Chala. What's Chala? Chala is a braided bread that we eat on the holidays. This story is about a very wealthy man named Asher who used to go to Shabbat services every single week. What's Shabbat? Shabbat is the Sabbath day the seventh day of the week when we rest. Now, back to our story. On this particular Shabbat, the rabbi spoke about bringing 12 loaves of challah to the temple just before Asher fell asleep. This story is putting me to sleep. (laughs) Believe me, it gets better. When the rich man, when Asher, he awoke, he thought that what the rabbi was saying was actually God speaking only to him. And so he went home, he got all of the ingredients, and he made beautiful challahs, and he came back to the temple on Friday morning. He 
looked around for the place that God would want him to leave them. And when he saw the ark, he knew that that was the place to put the chalice. He quickly ran up the stairs and he placed the chalice six on one side and six on the other inside the ark and he closed the door. A little while later, another man, his name was Judah, he came into the temple and he stood in front of the ark and he said, God, my family is so hungry and I work so hard. God, can you please help me? He thought, maybe God can't hear me. What if I open the doors of the ark so that God can hear my words better? And as he opened the doors of the ark, 12 chalas fell out of the ark. He was so, so happy. He gathered up those chalas, quietly closed the ark door, and took those chalas home to feed his family, not only for Shabbat, but for the week. I was hungry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Anywho, then the next morning, the rich man was at his usual seat in the temple, waiting for the moment when the ark would be opened. He wanted to see if God had accepted the chalas that he brought. And when they opened the ark, lo and behold, the chalas were gone. And so every Friday morning, Asher would place 12 chalot into the ark. And every Friday afternoon, Judah would take the dozen chalas out of the ark. It was a dance that continued week after week for many, many months. Well, one morning, the rabbi happened to be in the synagogue when Asher placed a dozen chalas into the ark. A few hours later, Judah took the 12 chalas out of the ark, and he understood what was going on. The following morning, the rabbi introduced the two men to each other. Asher said angrily, I thought God was taking the chalas that I brought. Judah said angrily, I thought God was taking care of me. The rabbi took both men's hands into his own and answered, You, my friend, have indeed been placing chalas into the hands of God. And you, dear one, have been certainly receiving chalas from the hands of God. Yours are the hands of God, and yours are also the hands of God. When we feed the hungry or provide shelter for the homeless, our hands become the hands of God. For God works in our world when we respond to God's presence by doing deeds of love and kindness, by acting with chesed. Amazing, right? What is the kingdom of God? It's where God is king, who is part of the kingdom of God, those who have surrendered their hearts over to the lordship and the kingdom of God, Jesus is king. What is the kingdom like? It's very different than the kingdom of this world. And if some of you are going, oh, it feels kind of far off. What do you mean by kingdom? We're actually more used to the term kingdom than we know. And one example would be Disneyland, the magical kingdom. Do you know what their value is? Because every kingdom has values. Their kingdom is that they are the happiest place on earth. By the way, that's why so many moms are disappointed there because the value is happy and anything like a long line that makes them not happy or people not treating them right or their kids just wanting more and more and more and not saying the word thank you. Or is that just me? <laughs> See, happiness is an amazing byproduct. It's a terrible goal. 
It's a terrible goal. It's actually, if you ask parents what the number one thing they want for their kids is, it's that word, happy. I'm gonna tell you. Then what's gonna happen is you're gonna critique every teacher, everyone, everything, every friend based on how happy they make your kids. And I'll tell you this, we need to prepare our kids better because the battle in this world is not against flesh and blood. And it's definitely not to pursue the values of this world like happiness. And the list of, by the way, of values of this world continue. Not just happiness, it's comfort. It's success. It's being known for how much you can get. And so as we consider what the kingdom of God is like, this rejecting ownership, remembering stewardship, proclaiming the resurrection, radically being generous, it's the opposite. Instead of seeking happy and you're seeking the kingdom, I'll tell you, seeking the kingdom looks a lot more selfless. Instead of pursuing comfort, you take risks in the faith. You say yes to the Holy Spirit nudges. Instead of pursuing success, you serve. Why? Because he came not to be served, but to serve. And instead of being known for what you gain, the church becomes known for how much we give. That's what the kingdom is like. And when is the kingdom of God, if the kingdom of God is where God is king, then it's absolutely now because he's king in our hearts. And it's also not yet. It's still coming in all its fullness. The easiest way to think of that is to imagine the seasons. Did you know that March 19th is the beginning of spring? Yay. But let me ask you this in Chicago, does March 19th always feel like spring? No. <laughs> it's officially spring in March 19, but it rarely feels like it. We still have to wait, right, for the sun, the warm, the flowers to bloom, the birds to chirp. Spring is here, but it's still coming. So it is with the kingdom of God. Friends, it's breaking forth all over the place. How? Good question. What are you up to? <laughs> That's where and it's still coming in all its fullness. Revelation chapter 11, 15 says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, this is at the end, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, this is our future, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the church said, amen. The book of Acts begins in Acts chapter one, and just before Jesus ascends into heaven, the disciples ask, Lord, are you at this time gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus' response says, basically, don't worry about when the kingdom is coming. You can't know, but I'll tell you this, you got a job to do, church. And he's equipped you with his spirit. So in response, we just need to consider our life and in light of the series and in light of Acts chapters two and four, consider our money. How is the Lord Jesus king empowering you to live under his rule and reign. I wonder if there's two responses today. Number one, have you received him as king? He's making that invitation. If you're wondering why you're here, that's it. That's it. Don't ignore the prompt that there's a king who is seated on the throne. And friends, the world will say it's you. And you're going to live your life in accordance. But I'll tell you this. Jesus is real, he really came, he really died to take that sin of yours that would keep you from him and he resurrected to place his own life, his own authority within your heart the moment you believe that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, you are Lord, you are King and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you get to be saved from anything that would keep you away from him and death is no longer the end of the story. Number one, have you received him as King? And number two, I invite you just like those first apostles, to open up your heart even this morning, to receive anew and afresh the Holy Spirit. And as you do, reject ownership, it's not yours. Embrace stewardship, proclaim the power of the resurrection through your radical generosity. Friends, I am banking on the fact that Jesus is King. How about you? Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we don't just need a, a word from you we need to open up our hearts to receive it and to respond to it. So I pray, Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would move us to respond. And I even wonder, how are you leading us to respond right now? Pray that we would risk, because I know that what we'll find 
is that the only thing we'll lose is everything we were hoping to lose all along. Help us release it for your glory. And the church said, amen. Amen.